When you think of the early history of electronic games, arcade video games such as Pong and Space Invaders quickly come to mind. And perhaps you think of the first home console, the Magnavox Odyssey, or even the massively popular Atari VCS. But before computer, arcade, and console games were commonplace in our daily lives, they existed in the form of innovative experiments at research institutions like MIT, where the well-known digital computer game Space War was developed in the early 1960s on a digital equipment corporation's PDP-1 computer. A few years before that important event, another computer game was invented at Brookhaven National Laboratory in 1958. Designed by William A. Higginbotham and built by Robert Dvorak and David Potter, Tennis for Two was an analog computer game developed as a novelty to entertain guests at the lab's annual visitor's day. This is the story of William A. Higginbotham's Tennis for Two and its recreation currently underway at Brookhaven National Laboratory. Brookhaven was founded as a direct consequence of the jump in size and scale of United States science during World War II. That is, during World War II, the, the size of the scientific community increased by a factor of 10. The amount of money that the federal government was investing in science increased by a factor of 10. In 1946, it was decided to create three national uh, laboratories. Argonne National Laboratory, outside Chicago, what was then called Clinton National Laboratory in Tennessee. And Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island. Of those three national laboratories, Brookhaven had a unique mission. Brookhaven's was the only laboratory among them whose mission was uh, basic research into atomic energy. The scientists looked for a site on the East Coast that might have uh, an infrastructure already present, which meant in practice a military base that was about to be abandoned. Now, fortunately, there were lots of them. There were induction centers uh, around the, the East Coast, and they were about to become available. So Brookhaven's mission was uh, to do basic research in atomic energy. The science of, of atomic energy was uh, a source of fascination for, for popular culture all throughout the 50s. Facilities like Brookhaven that engaged in it would occur in a lot of, of uh, popular culture outlets, including uh, cartoons and, and uh, movies and um, and, and comics. Brookhaven appears in Spider-Man. It appears in um, in a series of other movies of the of the era. So there were concerns because this was a government facility engaged engaged in scientific research. What was happening there? How uh, how safe was it? And the lab responded in several different ways. One of which was by having visitors' days. These visitors' days started in 1950. And what would happen is the residents could come in, and each department would set up a booth in the gym to show what kind of work it was engaged in. So the different departments would vie to put on the most interesting and attractive exhibit. And of course in 1958, Willie Higginbottom blew the house away with his, with his exhibit. Most of the exhibits were just, uh, you know, you look, look at this and read some words. So uh, Willie Higginbottom had the idea, well, let's try to make something a little more engaging and interactive. The typical table, and I'm going to say from the biology department, had three people at it, and they were probably biology professors from NYU or Columbia or something like that. The chemistry table had two or three people who were chemists from oh, DuPont or, or Brookhaven or wherever they were from, and the line for tennis for two went around the gym floor and out the building. People waiting to play for 30 seconds. The line to play the game extended out the door and around the corner, according to what Willie uh, recalled. The game that uh, Willie put together uses a cathode ray oscilloscope. It, it's a way of, of, of visualizing the, uh, you know, what, what, what's actually happening. The alternative would be just a, a voltmeter with a needle that would swing one way or the other. The oscilloscope allowed uh, actually rapid switching between the three signals that were generated by the, by the game circuit, the, the ball, the, the net, and the court. So uh, by, uh, by switching very rapidly between the three signals, it gives the eye the illusion of a, of a, of a game. In, in the uh, 1959 version, they added uh, the possibility to change the amount of, of gravity uh, so you could simulate what it would be on the moon and what it would be on Jupiter. Um, 
And uh, according to Willie's notes, uh, uh, th that didn't go over so well. The, 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 uh, if you simulate uh, Jupiter, the ball just boom, drops. <laughs> so when all was said and done, this was presented to the public in the autumn of 1958. And after incredibly overwhelming response, it was presented in 1959. At that point, even though it had garnered just as many lines, and it had actually gotten a few updates to make it a little bit more user-friendly, they brought in a TV monitor rather than the oscilloscope screen so that you could actually see it from closer than six feet away. Came time for the 1960 fair. And it was time, in Willie's mind, to do something else. He'd run that exhibit for two years. And he, did it still have the public interest? Of course it did, because they could interact. They could do something. They could actually hold something creatively that Brookhaven Lab had produced. After 1959, the game was disassembled. The oscilloscope, the Donner analog computer, these were put into other projects at Brookhaven. Because this was not a game that was ever prototyped, it was designed for novelty that uh, visitors would experience and play during these different open house days. So there was no prototype. It was never intended to actually be made into a product. So therefore, we don't really have this type of material evidence. For example, if one goes to the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, they can see the original prototype to the Pong coin-op arcade game. They can see it as they enter into the museum's computer game gallery. Or if one goes to the Smithsonian National Museum of History, one can perhaps access, if you're a researcher, the original prototype to the Magnavox Odyssey, the brown box. Other recreations of the brown box exist at other museums. So one can actually see these artifacts. With Tennis for Two, there's no material evidence. You know, Willie Higginbotham uh, didn't, didn't take a patent out on the game. Um, he in, in his in his notes he uh, he uh, mentions that uh, even if he had taken a patent out on it, it it would have belonged to Uncle Sam, and you know he he would not have uh, benefited from it. So uh, you need a, a van or a station wagon to uh, to transport it. I mean this this is not something you. You uh, carry around uh, in your pocket, you know. Which in it's interesting. On <laughs> in the very top, you do see a handle on the oscilloscope, giving the impression yeah. of how portable it is. And you know, I would also say that in terms of its weight and its size, how many families in the late '50s had an oscilloscope in their living room? His main emphasis throughout his career, if not throughout his entire life, was to be a strong advocate for nuclear non-proliferation. This is what he wants to be known for. In other words. He was not an active voice in trying to write his game into the history of video games. He had other interests. So there has not really been an advocate for trying to put this game into a larger historical consideration of video games. The 1950s, my dad, also Bob Dvorak Sr., worked at Brookhaven Lab in the instrumentation division as a five, six, seven, thereabouts year old kid. In those days, Brookhaven Lab had a very relaxed, almost academia, collegiate atmosphere, and nobody batted an eye if an employee brought a seven-year-old kid or a five-year-old kid to work with him. After it was built and actually functional, it was Bob Jr.'s day to go to work with Dad. And I came in, and the thing had not yet been presented to the public, but there it was, sitting on the bench and working and I got to play it, which probably makes me the first kid on the face of the earth ever to play an electronic video game. On this occasion, I probably spent the better part of lunchtime playing the game with him, and it's amazing when one looks at today's technology that you could be fascinated by this little dot moving back and forth across the face of an oscilloscope. But sure enough, you could actually see a tennis ball and there was a little net in the middle. You would bat the ball back and forth the screen. I have found out since that one of Willie Higginbotham's uh, challenges was to multiplex the signals so that the signals from the computer, which control the ball travel back and forth across the screen, also 
uh, created the net in the middle of the screen. To this day, I'll still play computer games, but I also proudly wear that tag that says I was probably the first kid to ever play a video game. In 1997 uh, was the 50th anniversary of the founding of Brookhaven Lab. The committee put out a, a call for the various departments here to uh, try to come up with, with some display or activity that the visitors could see that, that would highlight the work done at the lab. So I went into our archive files and I rummaged around and I discovered the two uh, schematics that he uh, references in, in, in his deposition. So I, I thought, gee, this might, might be interesting to, to see if we could uh, create, recreate the look and feel of uh, the, the game uh, from uh, 1958. Three of us mainly worked on it, and, and I think we each put in like about three man months of effort on this to understand the analog circuit and try to you know, recreate it. The problem we had was we had to recreate the analog computer uh, using solid state logic. There are two schematics for, for this. One is the logic circuit for the that involves the op amps. The other schematic was, I think, what Willie really uh, considered the innovation in, in, in this game. So I'm looking at these schematics. So what I'm seeing on paper here, this is the physical reality of it. This and this. These two Both components. These, right. Now I recall Dave Potter, who worked with Higginbotham at a time when putting this game together, he had a kind of a really unflattering way of referring to this. If I'm correct, didn't he refer to this as a rat's nest of wires? The wires would cross and short out all the time, so they had to continually uh, you know, debug it. So, so we wanted to build it <laughs> faithful to the original <laughs> model, and we built it uh, as Dave Potter uh, recalled. The game was corrected in the circuit. What that means is when Dvorak and Potter were trying to debug the game, they ran into a number of challenges. They solved those problems in the game itself. They never went back and amended the original design schematic so that we would have on record the corrections that were made. So in other words, if one tries to reproduce Tennis for Two from the original design schematic, they're not going to actually have a running game. In 97, uh, we had it set up in uh, the lobby of Berkner Hall. That's, that's where uh, uh, a number of uh, exhibits were set up. So we moved, moved the whole thing over there and uh, set it up. And it uh, drew quite a bit of interest. We had uh, um, I, I wouldn't say we had people lined up out the door to play it, but, uh, but there was a lot of uh, curiosity. Uh, in, in 2008 would be the 50th anniversary of the original video game. So we uh, basically pulled it out of uh, mothballs and uh, tried to uh, remember all the things we did <laughs> to, to get it running. So we had to go start from scratch, basically, and, and, and try to get it running again with the, with the solid state. And we did. We, we managed to do that. One aspect of Tennis for Two I find to be really puzzling, its name. You know, when did this game become known as Tennis for Two? If one looks back in 1958 and 1959, that name, Tennis for Two, was never used. Uh, Robert Dvorak Jr. discusses when he played the actual game and he's noted that they'd simply referred to it as computer tennis or TV tennis. The only moment when, and in his writing, when he actually offers a phrase that's very close to Tennis for Two is when he describes the game as follows, Tennis for Two players. And it seems that over time, Tennis for Two is sort of stuck. Any writings on a video game is primarily, let's say, in popular periodicals of the early 80s, refer to this game, if they even discuss it, as computer simulation. As far as I know, the first time the, the phrase Tennis for Two appears in print is in 2001 with Van Burnham's book Supercade, which is a visual history of the kind of classic video and arcade game moment published by MIT Press. Beyond that, it's now become a sort of kind of common currency to call this game Tennis for Two. A lot of published works devoted to video game history 
tend to be very descriptive, they tend to be very linear in terms of trying to chart these timelines showing progress, these sort of evolutionary models where one invention led to another invention, et cetera, et cetera. What I find really intriguing when one starts to research this game, Tennis for Two, is you realize that the history of video games is much messier. It's not a tidy affair as many would lead us to believe. In a sense, a lot of game histories want to pinpoint these very specific origins of when everything began. Tennis for Two shows us that there are many origins when approaching the subject of games within a historical context. It's a different experience from uh, you know, just a handheld video game because there thing, it, it, you hear the relays clicking and, and, uh, and you can see the ball moving and it's a, more of an immersion into the, into the game and, and it, it, actually, uh, it actually grows on you when you, <laughs> when you start playing, it sucks you in. We wanted to create the look and feel of 1958, but we, and in addition, we created the look and feel and sound of, of 1958.